So we'll again do the control input. Oh, I don't want that in value. I want to do, sorry. Um, I want it to be, be a float. So this will be my input voltage. And that'll be Vn. And then we'll just put that as analog. Okay? All right, so our input value. So what did we have to do with the analog value? Thing, you remember what we had to do to create the digital count? Add Q over 2, divide by Q, and then we want the integer value, right? Okay? So that, that's easy enough to do. We've got, we, if, you're, if you get lost with all this stuff, if you right click, you can find the terminal, and that'll, that'll help you out. So um, Q over 2 was over here, so let me get this over here. So we're going to add those two together. So we'll right click and get our uh, math functions there. So you can reorganize these if you, if you want. I don't usually bother. Um, and then, so there's going to be my the two together. And then I'm going to need to divide by Q, right? So I'm going to add a uh, insert. I guess I can't insert because I don't have a wire there. I'm going to put my divide in there, math functions, numeric, and divide. So I'm going to take that value and divide by Q, right? So Q is back in here. Sometimes the wiring, uh, the, if the wiring gets a little wild, that's OK. There's some cleanup features. Everybody does what we call spaghetti wiring, which means they're all going all over the place. But LabVIEW has, if you select all that stuff, uh, you can do cleanup wires and take care of it. So that uh, now we have the, uh, we did the division, and now we have to make that into a, uh, so that's going to be our digital count, if you will. Right, so if I right click on that and create an indicator, that'll be my digital count. Okay. Okay. So now if we run this, we get 8.5. We didn't want that to be a floating point. We want it to be an integer. Now you just can't change that directly to an integer. Well, you could, but we're going to have a problem if we did that. If I right click on this and just make it a, an integer, right, the U8 if you will, right, it, it, it truncated and went down from eight and a half to eight, okay? That's okay, except for the problem that we have if we make the input voltage, oh, it was it? Uh, oh, eight's not allowed, right? We can only go from zero to seven mm -hmm. on our little chart. So what's happening? Well, I'm, I've got an input voltage of 10 volts, so I'm way over here on the right, and I can't go above seven, right? Okay, so we got a trap for that error. So how are you going to trap for that error that you don't want it to go above seven? A loop? Probably not a loop, but a case structure, right? Because you want to do an if-then, right? So what's the statement that we want? If what? If the digital count is greater than or greater than seven, Make it seven. If it's less than seven, leave it, right? Because all the counts up to seven are good, right? It's only when we try and go above seven that we need to trap it, okay? So that's a case structure, right? So LabVIEW's got case structure possible. So the case structures are under your programming. So that's at the very top there. And this will be my structure. And here is my case structure. So it's a little true-false loop. You can do one of many, yeah, but the default is true-false. So we want to look for when that, that digital count is greater than 7. So you're going to use your comparison functions, which are in the math functions there. Uh, actually, no, it's in the, uh, it's in, I guess it's in programming under comparison. So we want to see when it's greater than or equal to, greater than seven, right? So we'll, we'll drop that on there. 
will create this to be a uh, created to be a constant of seven, and we'll take that digital count and drop it in there, and then that's we'll drive our our, our case structure. Now the case structure, uh, if you notice, the output of this comparison was green, right? So green is Boolean, true or false, right? So a comparison, it does Boolean, right? And of course that matches up with the case structure. Case structures always have a, um, a, a question mark or a decision input, right? Because we need to make a decision. So in the true case, what did we want to do? We wanted the output to be what? Seven, right? So that's easy enough to do. We're just, we'll, the output will come out of here. And if we, we, so we already have a seven on there. Let's change that representation to be a U8, right? So we'll leave that. I'll drag that in. I'll put my seven in here. And that will become my output out of my case structure. So that will be my output. Now when I do that, you'll notice that I get a white bar there. That's a tunnel out of my case structure. And you'll also know that my arrow is broken, right? That air broken arrow tells me that there's a problem. And the problem is, if I click on that, right, it'll say your tunnel is missing an assi assignment, OK? So if you click on that, LabVIEW will show you, but we know where it is going to be, right? You can show the error, right? And we know that. So why is that an error for us? Well, a case structure is part of your program, and if you go into a case structure, there must always be a path out of your case structure for both the true case and the false case. Otherwise, you could end up in limbo, right? So you got to take care of the, the false case. So we'll go over here to the faults. So now it's in the faults. What do we want it to be when it's under the faults case? We want it to be the actual value, right? Which was this digital count in here. Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna make one change before we do that because we had a floating point number and then converted it to a U8 there. But I'm gonna put my rounding function right in there because we, we don't want any, we actually don't want a float. We want a, a rounded uh, con value. So in the rounding function, if we insert this, we can go into the numeric palettes and find that we can round toward, in this case, round toward negative infinity, right? If you round down, that's rounding towards negative infinity. You can round up. You can round to zero. You can do whatever you want. So I'm going to round to negative infinity. And when I do that, um, it'll, it'll drop that value down. Um, so let me, so now I'm going to take that value and then put it as my output. It's still low. How can it still I got a conversion. So I'm going to take that value out. And that'll come out here. And now as soon as I wire that, my error went away because I've satisfied that condition. Even though I didn't do anything with it, I satisfied the conditions of the, of the case structure, right? Okay, so this should really be our digital out, account out of here. So I'm going to create a indicator, and we'll, we'll just call this digital count 2, if you will, and then we'll, we'll clean it up later. All right, so now when we run the VI, you'll see that it limits to seven, right? Because I trapped for that error, and once I went over eight, I trapped in and forced it, okay, to be, uh, to be seven, right? So I can actually take this original one away because that was not doing the right thing. I get a little broken uh, wire here, and uh, you just select that and you're good to go, right? Okay, so now I've done all the, really all the math I needed to do. There's only one last count thing I need to do, and that is to create the digital voltage, right? And the digital voltage is, of course, the digital count times, oops, uh, times Q. So, and this, so this will be, 
something that instead of being digital count, ought to be digital voltage, right? And so that's out here. And we have Q way back here. So I'll wire this in. And I'm going to insert the times in there. Insert time. Numeric multiply. And I want to take that digital count. That was my output here. And I'll wire it back to here. And then I get my digital voltage. Right? So uh, the uh, digital voltage uh, for a count of seven is, is, is seven, uh, seven and points, 8.75 volts, was, which was the highest count on our list. Where right, we are limited, uh, we can only go up to 8.75 volts, which was a count of seven, right? A digital count of seven, all right? So we, this VI then does all the math we need. Okay? Now, at this point, once you know this is working, you can kind of decide, do I need all these indicators or not? Right? Um, maybe you want to have access to all of these. Maybe you don't. It's up to you. But um, no, I don't think I would probably use them all, but we'll leave them all on there. Let's, let's look at our full program here. Okay? Uh, that's all going to be our program, right? The, the inputs are going to be the uh, in value, the FSR value, and the analog input value, and the outputs are all those other calculations that we made, right? Okay? So uh, now, at this point, you want to do a couple things. First, you want to save it, and then you want to do also uh, create all the... Uh, um, we we want to set all the uh, default values. So I'm going to save as, and this will just be my uh, <coughs> ADC calculator, if you will. I'll call it calculator 1, because I already built it. Okay, so that'll be ADC calculator 1. Okay, now there, um, the other thing that before you close out your VI, you'll always want to control so I get both of them. Underneath the uh, edit function, you want to make all the current values default. Okay? If you don't do that, when you reopen it, they'll all be zeros. Right? So that always frustrates students because they'll say those constants all go back to zero and that kind of thing. So make sure you do that uh, under, that's under edit. Make current values default. It really doesn't matter which values you use. I mean, I use 10 as my input, but you, you could use whatever you want. Otherwise, they'll all go back. Now, <clears throat> we looked over here. Um, to, to, that's our, that was our code. It's kind of messy looking, OK? Uh, there's a couple things you can do in LabVIEW. If you drag across all this stuff, you can, uh, <coughs> under some of the tools, uh, you can clean up the wiring, and I think that's under edit. Uh, yeah, clean, clean, uh, clean up selection. So when we do that, it kind of makes it a little easier to read. Okay, so that's a nice feature for you. Okay, that takes care of some of your spaghetti code or spaghetti looking stuff. And here's probably the best feature. Let me just file, let me save that so we know there. Right? Here's the, the better feature. If we drag across here, we can make encapsulate all this into a, um, it is to create what we call a sub VI. So when I drag across all that and say create a sub VI, LabVIEW is going to compress all of that math into its own little sub program. So it built me a sub program. That's in that little VI there. Inputs and outputs must always be able to be brought in and taken out of the program. So they're not encapsulated, right? All that's going to be encapsulated inside of there is the math functions. OK? All right, so that's the same thing. But OK, 
So now the question is, okay, we've got LabVIEW to create this nice little VI. How do we hook into that VI so we can program with it? Well, if you look up here in this, in this area here, this is uh, the last of the third, the third component of every LabVIEW VI. We have the front panel, we have the block diagram, and that's called the icon connector. Okay, so the icon connector is how you provide hooks to get into that, that program. A VI is just a subroutine. And you notice that they're different colors. What do you think the colors are? The colors are associated with my inputs, right, and outputs, right? Now, left view standard, inputs go on the left, outputs go on the right, right? So if I look over here, I have three inputs. Two are orange and one is blue. Which one is blue, Jaslyn? Which of my inputs is blue? In. In, right? It's got to be, right? So if you don't, if you want to see where they're connected, take your little wiring tool and click on there, and you see how it highlights that, right? So that little blue wire is going to do it. you does that assignment automatically for you, right? I can go through and check them all, right, if you want it. There's the FSR. It does it kind of based upon where they are in the picture, and then it collapses up, right? And of course, on the output, we have what? We have the uh, digital voltage is there. The digital count is there. The uh, number of digital states. Uh, the Q value is there, and the Q over 2 value is there, right? Now, um, so we can save this as a VI if we want. And I'll just call it calculator 2. It's really the same thing as before. Okay, but here's going to be the good part of it. Okay, so I close that out. Um, there was calculator 1. So let me, I'm going to close out those... Uh, that VI, and then I'm going to create a, a new VI. So now I'm going to create a new VI that I'm going to use for my plotting, okay? So now I'm go I want to be able to use that value. So whenever we do a plot, what do we want to do when we make that plot, Mike? We want to want to do what? We're, in order to make this plot, what are we going to do? we're going to check all possible analog input values from zero to the FSR value, right? Okay? All right, so whenever you make a chart, you're probably going to need some kind of looping structure, okay? So we've got two main looping structures in all programming. We got for loops and we got while loops, right? So what do we want to use, a for loop or a while loop? For loop because we have a definite num range that we're trying to go, right? Okay, so a for loop, all right, is going to be in the programming mode and um, under programming, we get a for loop under our structure, all right? So there's our, our for loop structure. A for loop has two controls or actually one control and one count. This I is just a counter telling us what count or which loop we're on or which iteration we're on. It's the iteration counter. And N is obviously going to be what? The number of times we run the loops. Now, LabVIEW runs loops from 0 to N minus 1. 0 is a valid state. So if I wire 10 in there, it'll run 0 to 9. Right? Okay? So how many times do we want to run this loop? Oh, I don't know. It's your choice. What do you want to run? 10? Okay. Well, 10. It would really depend on what you want to plot. Right? You probably want to have a few more steps than you have in your A to D converter. Okay? And since we don't care, it doesn't cost us anything, I'm going to make it a thousand. Right? All right? I'll just make it a thousand because it's not going to hurt me to do that. 
right? And I'll get a better looking graph, okay? All right, so now uh, it, the next thing is let's, let's make a graph, right? In lab view, we have two types of, well, there's actually multiple types of graphs. Sorry, we're running over, but this is our lab time, right? Okay, so we got two types of graphs. We've got what are called charts and graphs, okay? So in Excel, when you make a plot, that's really a graph. You're plotting usually X versus Y, right? The only people that use charts, who uses charts in the graph, right? Business people, business people, right? Because they don't usually plot graphs, they just plot things versus uh, how many sales per month or something like that, right? They're not true graphs, so those are called charts, right? They're both available in LabVIEW under here. A chart, what a chart is used for is plotting point by point data, right? Okay? A graph is going to be used to plot X versus Y or something like that, right? Okay. So we'll, we're going to put them both up here so you can see what they do. There's a graph and there's actually an XY graph. Now a graph is like an Excel plot, right? You're going to be plotting, it, it always gives you the default of time and amplitude, but you can change those quite easily, right? Now what's different about these two is one's going to plot point by point and the other is going to plot the whole set of data. Now, that means that we need to get the graph data after it's been generated by the loop, right? Because it's going to plot a whole bunch of points. That means we're going to need an array of data, right? Okay? So this is another automatic feature that LabVIEW does for you, okay? What I'm going to do is just plot both the I value as a chart and the I value as a graph. So if I drop this over here, and I drop this over here, you'll see LabVIEW says fixes my issues. My arrow's not broken. But what do you notice about the, uh, the lines that are in here? Inside the loop, these are thin lines, right? That means it represents one piece of data. But when it leaves the loop, it becomes an array of data. Sorry, I ran over your video. Okay, Thomas has got it though. All right, so right, that little symbol there is telling me it's collecting all the data and now it's going to be put on the graph. Okay, that's called indexing. Okay, indexing is taking single points and putting them in a spreadsheet, if you will, or a graph. That is a very powerful feature. LabVIEW does that kind of automatically for you. If you were writing your C code, your C++ code, you've got to dimension your arrays, you've got to do all kinds of things that cause poor programmers like me headaches, right? I'm not a programmer, I'm an engineer, right? So, let me, let, I'm going to turn on my highlighter here to run my loop just to watch it, right? So I'll, I'll set it sing, single step through. Uh, actually, I don't want to do that, do I? Um, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay, let me turn off my pause button there, and we can watch it um, plot. So you notice the chart is getting plotted one point at a time. Let me um, make my common plot here to be data points, right? I'll make this one data points too. You can do all this on the fly, which is nice. So you can see that, you know, it's just plotting each point at a time, right? Okay, nothing here yet because that is, all that data is being collected at that border, right, of the for loop, and it's not going to get let out until the for loop is done, right? So let me just take off my highlighter so I can speed it up here, and boom, there we go, all right? So now, so the data that was plotted in the graph was from zero to a thousand, right? Okay, that looks pretty good for us in our plotting, right? Because we wanted to get an X, uh, that is an input value, right? Okay, now the plot up here looks like it's kind of funny, but it, a lab view usually does auto scaling for you 
if I go back to here and type zero, right, and then type zero here, you'll see that they look exactly the same, right? Okay? Chart, point by point, graph, you know, continuous. So there's, there's both applications you'd want, right? Engineers, we usually like to look at data as a collection, but sometimes we want to monitor the level of a, a tank or something like that, so that would be a chart. Okay? All right, so now we're about there, okay? I know you don't believe it, right? But we'll get there, okay? Um, so the next thing we want to do is we want to do what? We want to integrate our A to D calculator into this system, right? So I've got an account of a thousand there, right? How about if I take that value and make that my uh, full scale input, and that's full scale range, if we divide that by 100, we'll get a value of 10, easy enough, right? Okay? All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna first drop in my VI that I created. So you right click on there, and at the bottom, you'll say select a VI. Right? When you do select the VI, the VIs that you created will be available, right? So we'll take the last one we created, which was the ADC calculator, and I'm just going to drop it in there, okay? So that's that whole section.